participation for anyone is important because it So you guys, you guys, yeah, exactly. Just make sure it's like we're holding it. Not like down here, like right in front of your mouth.
so can we do it while, while uh, Manuel is saying her part? So I, I should mention that there's a new switch. I'll mention it before I hand it over to him. So I'll just be right here and I'll just hand it start. Welcome back. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed lunch and had a chance to see the research posters and vote. The evidence to care team will be telling the results for the grand reveal today in the wine and cheese award ceremony. We are excited to introduce your town hall co-presenters today. It is an honor to welcome Lisa Boivin to the stage as well as BRI's postdoctoral fellow Julia Gray. Lisa is a member of the Dene Nukwe First Nations in the Northwest Territories. She is an interdisciplinary artist and a PhD student at the Rehabilitation Science Institute at the University of Toronto. Lisa uses digital paintings as a pedagogical tool to address the colonial barriers that Indigenous patients navigate in the current healthcare system. She strives to humanize clinical medicine as she situates her art in the indigenous continuum of passing knowledge through images. Julia Gray is a member of the Critical Disability and Rehabilitation Studies Unit at Holland Bloorview, led by senior scientist Barb Gibson. Julia's work spans the arts, humanities, and social sciences, and explores the intersection of arts, health, learning, and social change. Originally trained as a playwright and theater director with a background in dance, her program of research focuses on using arts to open up public conversations about experiences of kids with disabilities. 
as well as to explore the ways kids engage with art making in rehabilitation settings. Today's town hall called, uh, talk is called Image-Based Storytelling, a visual narrative on indigenous perspective or rehabil of rehabilitation. The purpose of this town hall is to create a space for openness, spark, and encourage important dialogue, support growth, inclusion, diversity, and a respectful exchange of ideas and perspectives. We will be looking for your thoughts and feedback on a number of questions. We want to hear your voice. That goes for all people in the satellite room as well, where we have someone who will take your questions and relay them on your behalf. Please join me in welcoming Lisa and Julia to the stage. Hi. I'll sit too. <laughs> Living on the edge. I'm uh, Julia Gray. I'm a postdoc fellow here at uh, at Holland Blur View, and uh, oh, hello, and um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm so thrilled to see what a great crowd there is. Um, uh, we're going to be talking today through um, Lisa's presentation about uh, indigenous and settler relationships, and we're going to be we're going to be also exploring a bit about colonialism and Canada as a colonized nation and what that means for health research. So I think it's apt at this point that I acknowledge that I'm a settler. And what that means to be, I was born here, but my, my parents, um, my parents' parents, my parents' parents' parents, <laughs> come from Europe. So on my dad's side, that means that uh, they came to Canada around 200 years ago, settled just around Kingston from England. And on my mom's side, she came as a child in the 50s uh, as Jewish refugees from Hungary. And I, I, I want to recognize that because, um, because really the focus of this is as I mentioned in many ways about indigenous and settler relationships. And often when we work with our indigenous colleagues, we invite them to place their ancestry and their, um, their culture at the forefront of what they're doing. And we don't do that ourselves. And I think, I, I don't know if we think maybe it doesn't matter or maybe it's a neutral, uh, but I would suggest that it's not. And I hope today that, that, it, that there's a space to be able to think a little bit um, about how it isn't neutral. And that um, if we want to do different kind of research, if we want to build better relationships, we being those of us who are settlers in the room, um, if we want to co-create with indigenous kids and indigenous families, then we need to uh, we need to approach things differently, a little differently, and that starts with reflecting on what we bring and some of the assumptions that we bring. So Lisa will share some of her gorgeous artwork, which is on the front of the uh, program. Also some of her beautiful artwork that's up there. She'll be sharing some stories about, about her family. You may find it's very emotional, there are strategically placed uh, Kleenex boxes around the room. Please feel free to take advantage. You may not be emotional. That's also totally fine. <laughs> uh, but at the end of Lisa's presentation, we're going to open up a discussion and all your perspectives, thoughts, feelings, they're totally welcome. And we will um, have an opportunity to reflect and to exchange ideas. And so without further ado, I welcome you. I'm so excited for your talk. <laughs> and um, take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm going to actually ask for something that's unorthodox. Um, I'm going to ask you to pass a rock around in a moment. 
But I was also going to ask you if I could take a photograph so I could send the picture to my mom, who's 84. <laughs> <laughs> also posted on my Instagram uh, to... Uh, I have uh, community members from my reserve who follow me on Instagram, and uh, I work uh, with some youth on our reserve, and I like to talk about uh, the importance of our, our research and how it matters and how we matter. Is that okay? Okay. So, um, there we go. All right. And I'm also going to do a video, and if everybody could say, hi, Lisa's mom. <laughs> All right, let's go. Hi, Lisa's mom. A very proud 84-year-old will be looking at this tonight. So thank you for indulging me. So our aim in this presentation, these are the uh, grown-up aims and things that we have to talk about. Uh, for me, sometimes talking about my research is really painful, so I'm grateful for uh, uh, Julia to make this slide for us. But it just talks about the idea of how we um, conduct uh, research and what are the implications of colonialism and how that impacts the health outcomes of Indigenous people and populations. Uh, so we, we're here in uh, uh, Toronto. Uh, this is where my community is. It's on the south side of Slave Lake in Acacho territory. And we peacefully share that territory with the Cree and the Métis people. We are the land and the land is us. Uh, so uh, land is a part of our identity. It's a part of our wellness. It's a part of who we are spiritually. Uh, these moccasins here were made by an elder in my community. I uh, was fortunate enough to present my research in Oxford, and the moccasins are made from moose hide and uh, rabbit fleece from my territory, because it was very important for her that I stood strong and presented my research as a Dene woman. Uh, this is um, a beach here where this rock comes from. This is a place where we go and pray, so I'm going to ask you to pass this rock around, and um, you can... Uh, put your energy into it. You can, if there's something you feel you need from me or something that you feel I need to know, go ahead and put in there. If you could wash away the great wisdom of Oxford, that would be great. It's a terrifying experience. You go there, <laughs> you present your research, it's torn apart. Who knew studying medicine would be so hard, but yes. <laughs> So I'm an image-based storyteller. So uh, Julia touched on that, how we identify ourselves, we identify where we are, and we identify our capacity as an individual in the work we're doing. So I'm from a long line of translators, uh, yet I'm the first person or the first generation in my family not to speak our language. So I translate it uh, through images. I'm also a healthcare educator. Uh, this was at the, Pop or the OPOP conference. Uh, I keynoted it. It's a pretty cool accomplishment, but I was more happy that I pulled off the sequence pants while I was doing that. Awesome. <laughs> uh, this is uh, me doing some outreach with OPOP, and that's the Ontario um, a Psychiatric Outreach Program. Uh, here I am with Dr. Zoe Thomas and uh, Dr. Allison Crawford, a bull psychiatrist, and Eva Sir Hall, who's a PhD student at CAMH. And I gotta tell you, after riding that plane, I needed a psychiatrist. It was <laughs> quite an ordeal. Um, so I don't really have a, you know, a, a, like a complex process. I mean, I guess just like a researcher, I observe, I paint what I see. Um, I'm very blessed to paint um, that I see my daughter. Uh, for generations, my family actually didn't have the privilege of raising their kids and they didn't see their kids. But I look at my daughter and uh, these little stars kind of represent her creativity and how I marvel at her. It's like uh, every time I look at her, a universe is growing out of her, her head. This is all her little sparkly ideas here. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at art together. Um, she's also an image-based storyteller. We look at images, talk about what they mean. Um, how, uh, how we feel about them as artists. This is Jordan making art. She's a filmmaker. Uh, uh, this was actually a fun process, big ordeal. I don't know if anybody's ever done stop motion. It's an outrageous, long, drawn out uh, procedure. It's kind of really fun to watch all the frustration. I don't know why anybody would do that with Lego. She did it with Lego. There was a lot of breaking and reassembling. Still, amazing experience. 
I paint my culture. So there are footprints in my uh, paintings and those represent uh, the uh, footsteps that we follow. We follow the footsteps in our ancestors and we also leave good footprints for our, our children and grandchildren. I also use footprints to acknowledge that many of our footprints have been erased. Myself and my, my own family, uh, there is uh, 10, uh, ten um, uncles and aunties, including my father, and then also six great aunties and uncles that went to residential school, and there's been six suicides in my family. This is uh, where we're said to be from. Uh, Denny Nukwai translates to Moose Island. This is the island here. Again, this is the, the beach uh, where the rock came from, and uh, we're said to be the people of Moose and Deer Island. Uh, painting my culture, uh, we have um, a story about Yamoria the giant who walked there before, uh, before um, we were regular sized people and last time I flew home I saw the, the uh, footprints. The, if anybody's flown over the tundra in Northwest Territories, there's these little lakes and some of them look like footprints and so these are Yamoria's footprints. <laughs> You can see here one foot is larger than uh, the other. My father had polio and uh, so we've got his footprints here, his moccasins here. And it just made me so happy. When I flew over the lake, or when, when I was flying over Slave Lake going back home, I saw these footprints and I was taking a photo with my iPhone, um, but it didn't come up as well as this. And then um, a Dene man uh, had this photo published in CBC North, his name is Andrew Beaverhoe, uh, and he is Dene as well. Am I an Indigenous researcher? So I usually don't categorize myself as a researcher, that's kind of a colonial notion of objectivity and uh, uh, soullessness sometimes, you know, or uh, we're often uh, uh, critiqued if we actually admit that we're moved and emotional and it affects how we, how we research things. My thesis focuses on the disabling effects of colonialism and uh, so I'm going to go through that. I paint my family's story to illustrate the colonial barriers that Indigenous patients navigate. Uh, so th I guess my father's story encapsulates two ideas of disability. The first one having the medical model forced on him and defining him as disability or as, as a person with a disability. The second one is actually uh, the clinical barriers that are created by colonialism. So. I made this uh, very high-tech diagram here with really fancy language here, so I hope you all can uh, understand what's going on here. So this is the trajectory of my father's life, and fine, not fine, fine, not fine. He was fine when he was at home, uh, engaging with the land, engaging with our culture. Not fine when he went to residential school. Fine again when he returned home, reunited with the land. And then not fine when he had to relive uh, his residential school experience. So these, this is the uh, diagram. Wouldn't it be great if textbooks looked like this, you know? <laughs> Fine here, interacting with the land, finding a way to um, create movement, even though he had a mobility impairment. So he just had a, like a little wagon and hung out with my, my grandmother. Uh, not fine in residential school, also falling under the clinical gaze where he's objectified and uh, diagnosed. Fine again, reuniting with the land. And then uh, not fine after reliving his colonial uh, or his his colonial experience in residential school. So this is how we all come to be in the world, every one of us, it's not just indigenous people. So we come with the medicine. And so what that means is before we come here, Creator gives us a little medicine bundle. And if we are raised uh, in, where we're nurtured and cared for, we will live a life that is fruitful and full of balance. So here the medicine is represented in utero, where this is this, the good stuff that Creator sends us with. And it's represented with strawberries and flowers. Up top here, these are the prayers and all the well wishing and all the medicine that our families, uh, uh, I guess, bring on to us. They pray for us when we're in utero before we come here. 
This is my grandmother and my father. I think about her all the time, especially now because I'm, my kid is older, she's 26, and I start to think about what it would be like to be a grandma. I'm so glad she's not here because she'd not be impressed with me. Not having kids, mom. You wait. <laughs> Uh, but my, I, last time I went home, I was told about uh, stories of my grandmother, how she had a lot of deep, tender uh, moments and was a doting, uh, loving mother. And uh, even knowing that uh, her kids were going to be taken away. So like I said, she's a mom of 10. She had the kids home until they were four. And then the Indian agent would come and take them away. And sometimes she wouldn't see them until they graduated when they were... 16 or 17 years old. So this painting is called We Had the Entire Day to Ourselves. And it's just, um, you know, a, a mom enjoying a day, feeling kind of blissfully tired, you know, walking home with her kid uh, from, from playing, sun setting there. And then, of course, we have the strawberries. Uh, strawberries are a women's medicine in our culture. Uh, the translation is also little heart. The word for strawberry is translated to little heart. So this is uh, one of the only photos of my father when he was little, uh, prior to going to residential school. And so this was taken shortly before uh, he went on his way. Such a cute little guy, so happy. Um, cutting away culture. Uh, one of the things actually that I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, I was talking to my supervisor, Dr. Stephanie Nixon, about how tiring it is being an Indigenous person, having to s explain about our history. Uh, so I encourage you, we do have a reading list and we'll talk about that later and you can hear more about Canada's colonial history. So this is my father and my grandmother, it changes all the time. Upon arriving at residential school, kids' hair was cut and their skin was washed with toxic chemicals. Uh, the severance from hair, to me, represents the severance from culture. That's a continual severance of culture that actually continues even after you finish the school system because you were expected to assimilate and fit into this colonial world. Uh, my father learned that he was disabled in residential school. Uh, we actually don't have a word for mobility impairment in our language. Uh, we don't have um, pre-contact words for disability. And the post-contact words that we have for disability aren't actually uh, uh, disparaging in any way. It's just a purely observational uh, word. Um, the measure of wellness is the ability to interact with the land. So. Uh, my father wasn't seen as, as, I guess, maybe kind of different, but not even different in the way we visualize different. It's just a, a, a different way to interact with the land. So they threw him in the wagon in the summer, and then in uh, the winter he went on a dog sled, and that's how he tagged along and hunted with the men. Uh, and this is obviously a much wider um, a uh, measure of wellness than the medical model, which is just based on the presence or absence of disease. So literally, your ability to interact with the land is the measure of wellness. So I did another high-tech diagram for you as well, something that is a little more tolerable. So here we have the medicalization of my father, as I talked about, the diagnosis of disability. We also have severance from land, we've got the roots here, and from culture, we have the scissors. We have the uh, clipboard, which represents consent. My father had over a dozen surgeries to correct his, uh, his mobility difference. I, as I said earlier, he contracted polio. Uh, and these surgeries were done without my grandparents' consent. Can you imagine that? Having your kid taken away from you at age four and having all of these surgeries without even knowing what's going on with your baby. It's intolerable. It's unimaginable, isn't it? But it's what happened. Paternalism. This is something that I hear. I hear a great deal of stories um, from community members when they find out that I'm a healthcare educator, they reach out to me for support. They, they talk to me about their experience. And I find one of the greatest barriers is the paternalistic gaze of the, of the uh, doctor. And so the little baby feet there are to ask clinicians to resist the urge to be paternalistic, to actually listen to their patients or clients and uh, figure out what's going on without imposing your paternalistic view of what's best for them. 
So this is uh, my father in uh, convalescing from two different surgeries. This is him outside of the Charles Campbell Hospital in Edmonton. After residential school, my dad came home and he got on a dog sled. Within a year, he was a champion dog sledder. Uh, if any of you have ever seen dog sledding, it's a sport that requires a lot of power, a lot of uh, lower body and a lot of core strength. So that was my father. He was interacting with the land. His mobility impairment was gone. He was doing what he was meant to do. And he was, he was amazing. He was... Uh, a formidable uh, um, athlete, just a, a great competitor, but he also uh, um, ran his life with such success. He had two degrees, he uh, created a business from the ground. He was an amazing, amazing man. And this was so different than what he learned from the doctors and what he learned from the people at residential school. Because often when kids with disabilities or different abilities have to interact in the school system, have to interact with clinicians, they're told that they can't look after themselves. And that was not the case with my dad. My dad could look after himself. Uh, Nuni. That is the word for wolf in my language. Uh, my father's Indian name was Little Wolf. And this is him in prayer, in ceremony. Again, I've got the strawberries here. Strawberries are in almost all of my paintings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the name for strawberry or the translation is Little Heart. I like to actually cradle people, cradle my family members in the love of the land. We've also got a caribou antler. Caribou antler represents the change of knowledge in between generations. It's a caribou uh, a story. Well, actually, it's a fact. Like every year, the caribou trails, they deviate slightly. The old ones lead the young ones, so they'll survive to avoid predators. And so we, as Dene people, we actually have changed our medicines so that we'll survive, our knowledge system so we'll survive. We have the drum here, which represents the uh, heartbeat, past, present, and future. We have the thunderbird there as well. A thunderbird is the carrier of knowledge, also the uh, conduit between creator and people. Um, I am also a thunderbird. I don't particularly feel knowledgeable, actually. Uh, my knowledge is unfolding in my images and it's something that I'm constantly discovering and it comes with a great deal of pain and, and anger, uh, often not even understanding what the knowledge is. This is my father uh, making his, uh, st his statement for common experience payment. Uh, so if anybody is interested in that, I suggest that you look it up, but uh, Canada decided to compensate uh, residential school survivors and it was a very egregious process where you went in for um, a independent assessment payment and so what you did is you had to go into a room uh, sometimes it was like a hotel ballroom or an office and you actually had to disclose your uh, your abuse I only heard about this process with through my father, right, between, you know, the silences of day-to-day -day candor, or, you know, talking about just little things at late night TV. And on Saturday, I actually decided to do some research on the internet to look at those forms, to look at how disgusting those forms are. And you're literally going through forms and you're checking off a box, um, measuring your, so things from, uh, verbal abuse all the way to uh, sexual abuse and actually quantifying them. And so for every check, you get X amount of dollars. So my father went through this experience to get this common experience statement. And it wasn't really about the money. It was to, to, to share his story, to have it recorded. And so here we have him making this statement and it's chaos. So we have the paper here and paper represents many things for me as an Indigenous person. 
It represents broken treaties. It represents broken promises between um, Indigenous people and uh, colonial institutions. And so we have these flowers of knowledge flying out of my father's mouth. We have the footprints here talking about our ancestry. He's also leaving good footprints for me. Again, scissors, severance from culture. And so what happened after this uh, statement was really, um, I mean, it's, it, 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 I guess it, it disabled him. It was the first time that I had ever uh, thought of my father as being disabled. So throughout his lifetime, he had different variations of uh, mobility. So sometimes he walked without a cane, sometimes a cane, sometimes a walker, sometimes a wheelchair. But it was always, always fluctuating as he got older. After this, um, after making this statement, uh, he was with a family member, Bess Ann. And she explained to me that his feet, she described his feet as um, looking like balloons. His edema flared up. And there was so much fluid in his feet and his legs, they were unrecognizable. So she took my father right from uh, the interview to Stanton General. And with it, in a short amount of time, he was transferred from the ER to the ICU. And he was there for three weeks. And I had a lot of conversations with the doctor because he was in heart failure. And uh, you know his belly was full of fluid. And we kept having to have these discussions. Do I come? Do I not come? How's he doing? And it fluctuated every day. So he did make it through. Uh, they drained 49 liters of fluid from him, but he never walked again. And that was, it just changed him. So he went from this big, strong, powerful man. He was still strong and powerful, but reliving that experience, it changed him. So what have I learned as a researcher? to always honor my father's story and share it respectfully. And that's something that's very difficult for Indigenous people when we talk about the territorial traumas of being Indigenous here in this place that settlers call Canada. We have to tell you the story respectfully, but we have to tell it to you truthfully, but we also have to protect and keep our relatives safe. So we do not want to reveal the indignities that they've suffered, but we want to tell you enough so things are changing. So that's something that I'm really learning as a researcher. It's also hard, like, because we're, there's so much pressure for us to be objective and unattached and not emotional. What can I say? I'm human. I argue, I argue all the time for indigeneity in the academy, and I argue ferociously for it. I follow our research protocols, so I talk a lot about culture, I, I share things that are appropriate, I also keep things sacred. I also go, I don't just, you know, blurt things out, I actually work with an elder, and I speak with my family and get their permission. I never impose a biomedical model of disability on myself or members of my family. They are who they are. And I don't practice the research methodologies of our oppressors. So if you want um, to take a look at the reading list, Linda Smith talks a lot about how research has been used to colonize um, Indigenous individuals. This is Lee Maracle. Uh, she is a Stolo elder, a scholar, um, a multi-award winner, uh, she's incredible. But she talks about how we as Indigenous people, we actually have to fight for our spot in the academy, and we have to learn how to be, you know, I'm going to say it out loud, we have to learn how to be white. We have to learn how to be white, we have to learn how to interact in a white system so we can argue to be who we are. But when we do that, when we change our words, when we cram our knowledge into the empirical essay, what we're doing is we are killing our sweetest voice. Those are her words, not mine. <laughs> so now we have this new science of indigenous methodologies. And these are great things. And there are these marvelous acts of reconciliation. Of course, we've all... Um, 
heard of uh, uh, Senator Murray Sinclair, but there's also other people that are um, responding to the, uh, the calls of the TRC. But here we have these, these acts of reconciliation, but still us as Indigenous researchers, you know, we are, we acknowledge that we're privileged to be in the academy, but we still have to respond with a colonial response. So it's, a, it's kind of a two-edged store or two-edged sword. So am I disabled or simply resisting further colonization? So I was diagnosed with a cognitive disability um, and I do have a hard time engaging with these like really stupid things that we have to do as researchers, right? Like scoping reviews and literature reviews. <laughs> like, like a literature review is not gonna change my research, it's not going to change the way I paint my father. It's not going to make me paint him more effectively. So I just finished my master's research proposal and um, my supervisor here, Dr. Stephanie Nixon, amazing, literally an amazing woman and takes her settler duty very seriously. But we had to go through my proposal four times and it was so painful for me. I cried and cried and cried a lot. And I, I argued for the space to create my images without um, clouding my mind with colonial pedagogy. But Stephanie's job, as much as she, she loves me and as much as she mentors me, is to put me in a position so I can pass. So she helps me <laughs> translate my knowledge in a way so uh, the academy will understand it. But it's a costly endeavor. So here is a painting representing that. So I'm supposed to be like writing furiously. What am I doing? I'm like, I hate the academy. This is what I'm painting. It's like, ah. So this is me. And so the words will not come before the images. I talk about frustration and I talk about knowledge. This is a very sacred knowledge system that I have been privileged to have. And it comes through dreams and it comes through ceremony and it comes through a lot of quiet, quiet thought. And so when I'm cluttering my mind with all these ridiculous research methodologies that are worthless to me and that have been used to actually colonize my people, I'm not happy. And so I've got all this knowledge, all these knowledges here, and then I've got these papers. And I'm at risk of losing the knowledge. You can see the butterflies and the flowers drifting off. So what do I have to do? I have to drop these. I have to drop the knowledge uh, of the academy and just take some time for myself. Because I became aware, actually, when I, <laughs> I had to come to the academy to realize that I am a Dene woman from thousands and thousands of years of Dene knowledge keepers before I'm ever, you know, at RSI, Faculty of Medicine. That doesn't matter who I am. Like, in the trajectory of Dene knowledge, I'm a Dene person, and I have to respect this knowledge first and foremost. So creating a visual narrative of the self to honor indigenous knowledge systems. So I have to paint myself to reassure myself and to care for myself in the academy. So here I'm in the form of a thunderbird, and over here is uh, Jolene Ricard. So Dr. Jolene Ricard is the chair of the Indigenous Studies Program at Cornell University. Uh, she is uh, the first Indigenous art historian and an incredible uh, artist. Um, she's done amazing things. So I did this residency with her. It was the Indigenous Art Journal at the BAMP Center for Arts and Creativity. And I'm so used to having to write these articles and cram my knowledge into this, this unfamiliar system. And basically, I spent probably two weeks of the first, like, of the first four weeks, or of the four-week residency, just crying and saying how angry I was and how I didn't want to come back and finish my master's thesis. And so she just said, yeah, well, just go ahead and give me whatever you have. I don't care. Like, <laughs> give me a picture, you know, write a couple words, write me a poem. And it was the first time that I had ever experienced that in my academic journey. Just come as you are. Give me what you have, because I know it's valuable. And so this, to me, symbols like the responsibility of being in a relationship with someone if you're in a position of power. Hold them, hold space for who they are as they are at that moment. 
So I'm just grateful to have that uh, interaction with her. And it's just for a moment too, you can see in the animation. She's also Tuscarora, so um, there is, their creation story is about uh, a sky woman falling from the sky, so it's something beautiful to look up if you're interested in some leisurely reading. So we're going to take a break, and Julia has some fancy lady questions for you that I couldn't think of. <laughs> She'll take over. <laughs> so we thought we would just take five minutes for you to turn to the person next to you, two or three people, and just have a quick check-in with each other about Lisa's story. If you want to share your immediate impressions. If you're not sure where to begin, um, you can also use this image as um, a talking point with each other. Um, you can just be really even basic and talking, you know, gosh, I see some red. <laughs> I see some flowers. Check that out. Uh, <laughs> It's just really an opportunity for you, uh, we might even take less than five minutes to just, just check in with each other. So that, and then we're gonna open it up to a, a bigger discussion. Um, go for it. Did you get to see it? I think I think you're the last one to have it. I think you're the last one. It's just me. <laughs> so that's why you know it doesn't exist in her culture. So yeah, I guess it's part of that colonialization that has destroyed her. For Brian, was it her grandfather? Her father. Her father. father. Her father. Her father. So they lost a generation there. Very sad. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I think so. I can. I can. Do you want to take it sugar? You're, you're Lori. Yes. Oh yes. Okay. Oh, so. thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Oh, great. Did you Oh, um, special needs, yes, intellectual disability, and autism. I hate to take the far wall, and I'm in like this side. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to take this aisle, and then okay. if there's like people on this side, I'll just kind of do like half of the Sounds good. Yeah. 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 No, no, but they have to be with me. It's the lab. Yeah. Nobody has voice to be right here. Um, and everything in between, and um, he is. They 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 have a big symposium type of thing. It's a three day annual workshop or, or presentation, and they have people from all over. And he is um, in
Hi there, everyone. Hi, everybody. We're going to refocus back over here. Awesome sounding discussions. <laughs> so I wonder, um, to start, we've got about 15 minutes to check in about um, your thoughts, about Lisa's um, presentation. And I, I wonder, I'll just start with really open uh, what did you think? What do you? What were your initial responses? I just want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, it must be very hard at times to to go over your story, and it's a very personal. But um, yeah, thank you. It's a beautiful story, and I love your artwork. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Well, maybe I'll, um, I'll toss a question to you. Um, when Lisa had up her chart uh, where it said, fine, not fine, fine, not fine, and then underneath there was living at home, connecting with land, being a residential school, being back home, and then having to relive those stories. What did you take from that? What did you think of that? I'm getting all cut up here, my cord. Um, mostly that the experience of res residential school, it's not, a, it's not a temporary item. It doesn't only exist while you were there, but again afterwards, and you don't know when it will come back. I think um, not only does it, it lasts for your, for generations um, as well. And I think uh, often people don't think of medicine as a government institution, but because Canada, even before Canada was Canada, there are these failed relationships between indigenous people and these institutions that things like access to consent or feeling safe in, um, in a hospital are, are not available for people who suffered uh, those, violence, those violences in residential school. So often people don't go to the hospital until they're very, very sick, until they have to. So, yes, thank you. There was a, yep. Thank you. Um, so I thought of a couple of things that the fine, not fine, because I'm going through this experience uh, and have a child admitted here. And I am of multi-generation settler stuff, but my partner is Inuk and my three kids are Inuit and we're really far from home. So we live in Nunavut and um, I'm also a physician, so I'm seeing it on the other side. Um, and it's so important for us to be here and to get better, like truly better care and, and, that, and it's also an urban-rural thing. It's not just indigenous, non-indigenous, it's urban-rural. And so for any families, that trade-off between knowing how important it is to be in your home and in your normal life, but knowing you need to be in a big place is really, really hard. Um, and in uh, Nunavut, our Department of Health, I don't know who they paid to brand it this, but, but it's a good motto, care closer to home and trying as much as possible to get, get services uh, locally, but, you know, but it's a reality, and it, I mean, a, a true reality, resource constraint, and you can't have a dialysis unit in every community of 200 people, you know, like, you just can't, and not that that's my issue, dialysis, mine is pediatric rehab, and I'm very grateful to Bloorview, and remind you that Nunavut, our tertiary care in the Eastern Arctic is Ottawa, and Ontario, so it is like, I know Bloorview prides itself on taking care of not just Toronto and not just rural Ontario, but I'm, it was very hard work to get my son here and I'm so grateful to be here and I'm really grateful for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Question. 
So again, I just really want to thank you for naming colonialism in the academy. I just think it's so brave for both of you. And um, I'm the daughter of parents from apartheid South Africa, so colonialism is something that I feel very deeply. And I just think it takes a lot of courage to name it and know it here. So thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to ask, uh, what is the reception been like of arts-based methodologies uh, in the academy as you go through your journey as a researcher? <laughs> we, yeah, um, well, it's been, uh, we talk about this a lot. It's, um, it's uh, a lot of times people don't know how to interact with art, um, but then because my, um, my practice has to do with colonialism, people often realize really quickly, right, that they're implicated, right, as, as, as settlers. Uh, so I get a lot of resistance. I mean, I've had people tell me that um, my research is soft. Um, I had somebody in, uh, in, the, in my program ask me if, uh, don't you think that you're disempowering your patients further by assuming that all Indigenous, or don't, don't you think that you're, sorry, disempowering indigenous patients further by assuming that they've all been disempowered by colonialism. And I was frustrated because she couldn't understand that acknowledging that all indigenous patients have been disempowered by colonialism doesn't impose a pitiful view on them. Rather, it speaks to our resilience, our resiliency and our power. But it's, it's a lot of conversations, a lot of painful conversations. Um, f for me, and because my stuff has to do with colonialism, it has to do with racism, people often find ways for me not to argue about racism. And the thing is, is we're very arrogant in the academy. We have this idea that we interact with our rational capacities 24-7. Nobody does. We all have colonial biases. We all think thoughts that are racist. Every single one of us does. And all we can do is acknowledge it, be open to that knowledge, and improve who we are. Um, so I get the resistance of, of art um, a lot, you know, with the soft research comments and how, it, you know, it's interesting, but it doesn't fit. And those sometimes are really phase me, or don't phase me, but it's the, the argument for not ar or that that arguing about racism is 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 not um, is not necessary because it doesn't exist. Equality, right? I find I'll just add a little something to that. That um, I find there's a, a curious tension with arts-based research that people are often curious, seen as innovative and exciting, um, even though it really has been around since humanity was first came about. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that it, you know, that the certain sort forms of knowledge are privileged over others, uh, and respected more, and that, um, this, this sort of, um, exploration is not valued in the same way. And, and that's something for me as an arts-based researcher that I'm keen to, um, open up conversations about. I think that's part of what this makes this so powerful is that we're not just hearing, you know, the goal was this and this was the method and this was the, you know, that we're we're exploring this in a this this topic, this thing, something that's shaped all of us in this room. It's not just about Indigenous people. It's also about the settlers, and we're exploring it through um, story and we're exploring it through um, visuals, and that that allows us to explore in a different way. Um. And I think I could just add one more comment on that, is that people um, often don't think of like the high utility that art has and the expedience of art. So I've showed you these images, and the images have sparked your curiosity. And you know, you might actually go and read about some of these things. Whereas like how many of us read an article and like literally don't even think about it? I've read probably like uh, I don't 5,000 articles, right, in my undergrad and you know through my masters now, and I can probably actually all of the articles that I can remember are 
almost completely all parent patient narratives. So art's really important. Maybe maybe we'll go over that side of the room. <laughs> Luckily, I already have a Hello. mic. <laughs> um, based on sort of the last, just the last little discussion uh, about sort of what's being presented, what methods are being used, and, and uh, what's available to be knowledge. I'm curious how you view truth and how you argue for the idea of truth in not just the research that you do, but the general work that you do. That's a biggie. Just, 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 just simple. Tell us about truth. I, um, I work from the perspective that truth is more often than not situated in some way, so there's always a context. Um, my physicist uncle might not totally agree, <laughs> but, but um, um, my experience of the world is totally different from, and Lisa's experience of the world, it's situated in different ways, it's been shaped in different ways, um, it, and, and the research that I engage in is always interpretive. It, it, it couldn't not be, if that helps you. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think about what truth is and how, how truth is um, looked upon in the medical model and research and also how we look at truth in our day-to-day -day lives. And I, I guess what I refer to often when people ask me about truth is a saying by uh, Charles Eastman Ohiesa, who was an MD and a, um, he's Dakota from Wisconsin, a uh, historian. He's written many books. But he says, an Indian must believe all miracles or none. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree you know, on everything. But what it means is that you have to acknowledge that every person has their truth, and you have to hold it as sacred as you hold your own. It's just as valuable. There was a, in the middle. I, I wanted to come to your uh, point about objectivity, and, and I would use the language of epistemic violence that that imposes, that you can't have emotions, it makes you, somehow you not objective. And I just, I think one way to think about this is I've seen so much emotion in this room today outside of this presentation. And so I think if we can hold on to that, that a lot of people in this room are driven by passion or frustration with how things are, knowing they can be better, there is emotion in all of the research I've heard here today. So I think if, if we can start to at least appreciate that, we might start to crack away at that idea of objectivity. Hi, Hi thank Lee. you so much. Um, I just wanted to share that when you speak about your experience, your indigenous experience, I see so many parallels to the experience of disability and people with disabilities and families with children with disabilities because you're talking about having to justify your experience through a system that devalues it. And, and I just see so many parallels to the disability experience and even here with how much we value academic knowledge, and yet um, we're representing people, many people who have intellectual disabilities, and so what are we really saying about the value of different ways of knowing? It, it's almost like we have to kind of um, fit a, a, another culture or another way of living. We have to justify it through these academic research methods, which in fact are devaluing it. So it's just, it's that feeling of just feeling like your way of understanding things is not good enough. It's, it's not even, ha it's like it's, it's obvious, like it's having to justify it, I guess, as an Indigenous person, justify our knowledge systems, but also to be knowledgeable of the fact that other people benefit off the domination, domination of our knowledge systems. 
people benefit off the domination of this idea of normalcy or perfection. So it's very, uh, you know, you know, often we'll talk in the academy about dominant research methodologies. And it's something that people, that it's, it's so obvious to me, but people often don't see it. When you're using something like dominant research methodologies, it actually means that you're dominating someone else. They've become dominant research methodologies because they're seen as more valuable. I see we're almost at time. And I wanted to bring this postcard, which everybody should have hopefully gotten in their, uh, here we are, what do we do next? Uh, in your program, and if you didn't, there are extras floating around. But on the front, we have Lisa's gorgeous work. And on the back, you'll see that there are some resources. So, you know, we only had an hour today. There's only so much you can accomplish in an hour. Our hope is that you can use these resources as you think to how you and your labs and your program of research, how you can connect with and co-create with indigenous kids and indigenous families. These, these can help you. This is a good beginning point and there's work that you can do um, and it's, it is context specific. It's context specific in terms of what those families that you're working with, I think Blurview is kind of already on that train, but um, the communities that you're working with, but it also involves reflection yourself in terms of, well, what, what, are my, what do I not know? To go back to the, the session that we had earlier, how do I know what I don't know? Possibly, this is also a place to start. There's also um, resources here about indigenous research methodologies, which includes participatory approaches, how to work with community members um, to uh, develop research projects. Does anyone have any extra awesome or even not so awesome thoughts as we wrap it up? Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Oh, this one. Oh, wait. There's one. There's this one lady over there. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for sharing your story with us at Head Home on so many levels. Um, I had a question. How do you s stay in a healthy place mentally, spiritually, and physically every time you get up and you go to work or you go and do some research. How do you, how are you able to fully accept your, pres your presence within the academy? You know, it's interesting because we also, you know, researchers will often talk about balance and priding themselves on wellness. And I don't know if anybody's ever read like a, um, a biography of like an artist, but like nobody's like, oh, I've got well-balanced relationships in my community and everything's amazing. And um, I, to be honest, I, it's exhausting. And at times I'm, I, uh, I'm not healthy. I have exactly the right, exactly the right uh, supervisor who, if I experience racism, it's just like, I tell her, forget about it. She handles it for me. It's, it's asking for help. It's, uh, it's also understanding who I am in the natural of order of things, who I am in the world. I'm an image-based storyteller. This is something that I agreed to before I even came to this planet. How do I maintain wellness? Yesterday I had an exhausting day and I just, you know, I went to this fancy thing and I just couldn't wait to get home and eat chicken wings with my daughter and go see a silly movie. So I spend time with my daughter and then I also remind myself of what I agreed to. And I tell these stories and I exhaust myself and I cry and so my daughter won't have to. That's what I do. Thank you. All right. yeah. Thank you, Lisa and Julia and everyone in the audience uh, for your engagement in the town hall. We have a small gift of token, a small token of our appreciation. 
Um, thank you for helping us to be a bit more informed to have conversations about colonialism and indigeneity. When Manuela and I were chatting, we were, we were struck by the fact that your, your father did not learn about his disability until he was put into residential school. And Manuela commented that we have so much to learn um, in terms of uh, getting to a point where society is truly judgment-free. And I think something you said about uh, come as you are is really that message of uh, welcoming and diversity that we're all uh, hopeful will be in our future. So thank you again. To close our symposium, it is our great pleasure to introduce the Mickey Milner International Professionalship Lecture given this year by the esteemed Dr. Roberta Woodgate. Dr. Mickey Milner, for whom the Professionalship Lecture is named, was the first Vice President of Research and Rehab Engineering at what was then the Blueview Macmillan Center. Mickey is one of the world's best known and most highly respected rehabilitation engineers. He has trained a generation of rehabilitation engineers, modeling the integration of research and clinical practice. The 2017 Mickey Milner keynote is Dr. Roberta Woodgate. She's a professor at the University of Manitoba in the College of Nursing. She also has an appointment in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, Faculty of Medicine, University of Manitoba, and a research scientist appointment with the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba. We are thrilled today to welcome Dr. Woodgate to the stage to deliver the keynote. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here today. Um, that's a tough act and many tough acts to follow. I, it's kind of hard being at the last person at the end of the day, so I hope you'll enjoy my presentation. I'm just waiting to get the clicker for this presentation. Um, I think they ran off with the clicker. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, so today I'm going to present on a study that I did that looked at how families of children with complex care needs participate in everyday life. Um, but before I talk about that study, I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself and the type of research that I do. Um, when I started research, it was very rare for people I'm not that old, though, just, 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 but it was very rare for people to sit down with a young child, a youth, or a family to ask about their, their experiences. And that's been the basis of my research. So I've always focused on trying to engage families in research and young people and children. And to do that, I do a lot of qualitative methodologies and art-based methodologies, um, such as art, photo voice, body mapping, theater and so on. Um, if you just want to take a look at this one um, picture, this was a, a, done by a youth in my youth with, living with anxiety study. And take a time to read the, um, the quote that is, go, goes along with the, the picture. And as we talked about today, about arts-based methodologies, how the, powerful they can be. And I would like to see a day where we don't um, put everything into boxes, arts, sciences, and so on. Research is research, and you pick, do the method that works best and what, what's going to get your answer. So again, um, in this study, this youth anxiety study, if I could only, the, the photos that they took, the pictures, the interviews are so powerful. Anyways. And, and again, um, my, my research program is entitled Engage, and that is a play on trying to engage families, children, youth, and also decision, decision makers, clinicians, and so on. Everybody who's involved in whatever aspect that we're looking at should be involved. And this is again from one of my young people in the study about you know, um, what they could contribute, a 10-year-old, to research. And I like to say research, Instead of doing research on children, it should be with children and their families and by children and their families. And I'm at the point right now in my career where um, I have youth um, and family advisories committees and children committees, and, and they're involved to the point where now, now that they're, they're telling me what should be the next research study. 
So um, at one of, with my anxiety study, I submitted a grant that's going to be looking at self-harm in young people. And again, that came from my Youth Advisory Committee. And one, a couple of the youths are on the research team. And the study that I talk about today as well, um, our Family Advisory Committee, the next study like we'd like to work on has come from what their voice is. So I, I'm just going to show you some examples of the, of the work that I do. So look, just finishing off a study looking at families of children with hemophilia, how they transition to, through key care um, transitions from the time that the, the family discovers the first bleed, um, when they be, go into uh, toddler school age to, to young adulthood and so on. Um, again, young people living with anxiety. Um, understanding disability from the perspective of First Nations families of children with disabilities. Um, this is a study that I completed with, in partnership with Indigenous people. Um, basically, we um, were the study was conducted in a in a, 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 a Manitoba Reserve um, Norway House Cree Nation, um, and then looking at Aboriginal youth living with HIV and uh, the journey of survivors of childhood brain brain tumors from post-treatment into adolescent and adulthood. Um, these are just some of the studies I've done. And you're probably wondering, you're saying, I'm all over the map. But I'm not all over the map. I don't uh, specialize in conditions or um, diseases and so on. It's the ex lived experience of people going through these different challenges. And what I found through my work that over the years that there's many similar themes that these individuals experience and also, also differences. But it's not about the condition, it's about the challenge that they're going through. So, oh, and also uh, have done work with families who um, have had caring for children with autism. So um, I'm going to talk today about my study looking at families of children with complex care needs and how they participate in everyday life. Um, we know um, that you know, more and more children with, with complex care needs are at home, that complexity is increasing um, from physical to developmental, um, emotional, intellectual. And we know that caregiving can be very burdensome. There's been research on it, um, the stresses that it can cause, and also, also by the hidden costs, looking at lost rate, wages, um, a, a, a decrease in employment, health, increased health care costs, and so on. So we know that families experience, experience stress um, in caring for their child with a complex care needs. They want the child to be there, but nonetheless, it is stressful. Um, but you know, one thing that we don't have a, we don't know as much about is how families of children with complex care needs participate in everyday life. Um, you know, what is their daily experiences? How do, do they enjoy life? How do they get about life? So it's not so much about the caregiving, although the caregiving impacts how they participate in, in everyday life. So with that, um, I undertook a study that it focused on looking at um, how you know the changing geographies of care influence the ways that Canadian families with children with complex care needs participate in everyday life. I know that's a mouthful, but um, it's basically what how do they participate in everyday life? Um, this was qualitative, um, involved multiple interviews with families. We interviewed them at three points in times to see how their care changed, uh, how they participated, and how care impacted their participation in everyday life. Um, so we interviewed them, interviewed parents, interviewed children when we could, and also interviewed the siblings, some separately, some with the, as a family unit. We did what, what worked best for the family, and we, did, we tried to involve families in three points in times. And of course, understandably, not everybody was able to participate in three points at times due to the busy schedules. We also had families um, during the interviews to draw eco maps. Now, eco maps can give you a presentation of your family and also who are you connected to. The important places, um, different landscapes, um, different um, um, people in your life, activities, and so on. And then they would connect lines through their through these um, places that they're connected to. And sometimes the lines were disconnected that showed dis disruption in their lives. There was no lines. Some families had basically the family unit, and that was who they interacted in everyday life. We also did photo voice. Um, photo voice is a process where, uh, where, we, where we first interviewed the families, and then we gave them cameras, and we said, go on into your world and take pictures 
of what it's like to participate in everyday life. We also gave the cameras when it was possible to the siblings and also to the children. But most of the photos were done by the family unit. We had them come back after a period of three to four weeks, and we interviewed them again, and we said, you know, tell us about what, what these pictures t are telling us, what's missing in your life, you know, what's important, and so on. And we also followed up on the interviews, um, from the previous interviews. We then, um, and I also con did, uh, completed field notes throughout. Um, in the study, we had 40 families participate, and actually, you could, you, could, you could just tell by the, what the care involved in caring for a child with complex care needs. This was one of my first studies where I almost had, well, not equal, but 29 fathers participating, which is a really, that's a good number because, um, you know, usually it's just the mother that you get to chance to share their experiences. So we had 68 um, parents. Um, the children who uh, they, they cared for had a variety of different conditions, um, cerebral palsy, developmental disabilities, um, seizure disorders, um, terminal cancers, and so on. So, what was meaningful participation for these families in the study? You know, whereas, you know, we talk about participation being about doing for the families and also the children and siblings, it was about being, being involved, um, being a part of a social process, a dynamic, dynamic social process. And as you can see, one of the mothers talked about being involved in a, in a group, um, you know, whether it's um, Boy Scouts or a service group and so on. And also, uh, one sibling had said um, it was about being a part of something. So it's, doing was important, but it was being part of that group. Um, this one mother, if you take time to read the quote, talked about her child who was, uh, had severe um, complex cognitive, um, physical, and so on um, dis uh, disabilities. But this child was participating by just being involved, by just being at that game with her family, and so on. So for, to this family, this was um, meaningful participation. Um, I'm going to also show through this presentation some of the videos that I did with the family advisory group. When I asked them, how would you like to see these findings presented, they thought having videos done, um, uh, done of the main themes, and they, the families took part, part in, the, in the videos, and we re-interviewed them. So I think we're going to show you one right now where they're talking about meaningful participation. Participation for anyone is important because it gives you a sense of belonging. You know, you, you have new experience. Yeah, yeah you, be, you, you want to be included, you want to belong. And you learn new skills, new experiences. So anytime Daniel's had the opportunity to be, you know, in a gym class or an art class or, mm -hmm. or any other kind of opportunity like that to, to make the adaptation so he can fit in and do his participate. best, participate as best he can has been really, really important. Mm -hmm. When he was in phys ed class, they played tag and they played whatever dodgeball and they whatever. And his phys ed teacher was really, I, I thought, a real smart guy in terms of thinking outside the box and how can we get Daniel involved in this game? Because he had his walker and he couldn't run far, like he, he could walk quickly, but that was about it. He got him a Nerf gun with with this thing that could mount onto his walker so he could play tag. tag with this and he could tag the kids with the Nerf gun and he just loved it and it was a real fast loading one too so I think he yeah. got lots of kids real quickly. Yeah. Um, so you know that was an example of, of just you know being part of it. Participate. Being, yeah, being able to participate not just not just a, by, not not just a bystander. bystander and just watching. Yeah. We feel very much included in the school system, both when he was at Lord Roberts and now at, at Grant Park. The kids get to participate in the school plays and they're, they're very much part of the fabric of, of the whole school experience. I don't know that we've ever felt particularly excluded by anything that's more of a, maybe that's more of a perception that we, we have that colors everything. Um, I'd like to show more of the video, but just to be able to, to um, complete this presentation. Um, the father had talked about being excluded, so um, he, he didn't have that experience. But families talk about meaningful participation. To have meaningful participation, there were certain characteristics that had to be present. 
And as you can see, choice was very important, having some say. And even for the younger, for the youth, having a chance to take a risk of some, something where you, you have safety, but you also have to have, to have choice. Um, a really key one was acceptance being accepted by those around you. Um, on this one family talked about, you know, we take the child out, but you know, you also have to have that escape route in case that child um, um, that does something that may not be looked on by others as being um, appropriate. Accommodation was also important for others to accommodate, to make it possible for meaningful participation to take place. This father shared his experience of his son where at school, this was the first time that the school accommodated that family by um, uh, 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 having a room that, that they created where it was almost not like a hospital room, but it's where the child could go and take rests in between during the day, so because it's a, lo a long day and because of his physical disability. So um, this father found that not only did they accommodate his child, but this was a start and would help other children. So And accessibility. This was one of the key things. Accessibility, um, in going places, um, just the whole issue from um, going to the different buildings that are supposed to be accessible, but are not. And as you can see, um, what these, well, this young, uh, young participant in the study talked about um, barriers in um, uh, having meaningful participation. And this is a series of pictures that one of the young persons in the study took. How um, this was a, in the building that she was going to was a healthcare setting that isn't so old. And how to get to the washroom, to the sink, to just to go to the washroom. Every there was a barrier after barrier. And she took a series of photos just to show this. And these are some of the other photos that families took about um, you know you know, in, in accessibility um, to, um, you know, making it possible for families to participate. Experience as something less. So an inclusive landscape, to me, it would mean somewhere that anyone can go, no matter what the condition, no matter what the needs of the person is. I think like when they say a building is accessible, but it's still missing something, it's usually something small that someone without a disability wouldn't notice, but someone who actually has one would. So like I've been places where like, yeah, like you've mentioned, there's been a ramp, but the door isn't accessible, so you can't actually get in on your own, or the button is like across the room and the door, you can't get to it in time, or like one step up to the door that has a button, like just things like that make accessible buildings not accessible. Yes. Exactly. Any place that would uh, require diapering or grooming uh, if they don't have a big enough bathroom, for example, then that is a, a problem and that is a concern that we, we have to keep in mind. And uh, that's probably too true for anyone who's got uh, a kid that's confined to a wheelchair or has mobility issues. If, if we had some kind of a, a gathering at our house, it was never really all that major of a problem because we could always take Beth to her room or we could you know, accommodate what she was doing relatively easy because we were home. We sometimes might have felt isolated in, in the sense that uh, it was just too much to go out. And then because when Beth was younger, she was somewhat unpredictable in her behavior and I just didn't want to have to deal with the seeing in public. We used to like to go to the theater. That, that sort of became kind of impossible. And we found that our friends really liked to do those things and they continued to do that. And you know, it wasn't that they were excluding us. It just it was difficult for them to accommodate us then. And maybe if they had understood a little better, they, they would have had more events where we had family gatherings. With, with my family, that as Mary grows older and gets heavier and it's much more difficult for us to get her from point A to point D, 
on vacations to go visit family. They just don't understand just how hard it is to do that. And they wonder why we don't go down there to Ontario as often as we used to. And we wonder why they don't come out here where it's far easier for us to, to handle Mary. There's no long car rides. There's no long plane trips. Planes are not designed for children or adults who are incontinent, that they just have small little washrooms. They just don't understand how physically hard it is for us to deal with Mary. Just in the last few weeks, we have a new van, and it's a van that has a, a side ramp that comes out, so Mary, for the first time when we travel around, can stay in her wheelchair. We don't have to lift her up into the van and then pack the wheelchair separately. That, that in itself is helping now, and will help in the next few years to help us get Mary around. We're not getting any younger, so and Mary's not getting any lighter, and it's those twin challenges that we're starting to come together to make it a, a little bit more difficult for us as a family to... So as you can see from those videos, um, to have meaningful participation, there's many um, dimensions that have, to be, that have to be in place for families to participate. Another important finding about having families participate in everyday life was it was important for people to get to know the child and the family and to understand and accept them. Um, very important about, you know, understanding, accepting and listening to their child and really getting to know the family. Um, here's some examples about being known and about how when people don't understand how it can be a problem, as this one sister or sibling had said. And at the same time, for others to get to know the child and the family, it was also part of the family to, uh, to learn how to, to know their child. And some, for some ch children with um, limited cognitive um, verbal abilities, it was hard for families to, um, to get to know their child. And this also shows the expertise of families who know their child better than these quotes, who know their child better than anyone else. And again, a couple of other quotes about knowing your child and how sometimes it can be difficult to know your child. And how families take time to figure out and work involved in figuring out their child. Important to be listened to in, in any of these in this process because you know living a life with challenges or living a life with a, a child with challenges is a, it's a process and like I said there's hiccups along the way there's things you encounter that other people don't necessarily see because they're not living yes, it right right and so you really have to explain and so it's it's really important that people listen to and not only to us it's important they listen to Daniel and he's really been the biggest kind of spokesperson he's very vocal yes he's very vocal yeah, he's he, he's learned to advocate for himself so, right and and he feels that he's be, uh, well at least i assume he feels he's being listened to as well so it's it's important in the case of a kid with special needs who's nonverbal, to know your child you have to be very aware of body language so there's a little bit of de detective work involved on the part of the parent you almost have to develop a sixth sense about what they are trying to communicate to you because uh, certainly in Dean's case a lot of the same sounds can mean different things in different contexts like a uh, uh, happy squeal could also mean that he's about to have a big seizure. You have to be aware all the time of how he's feeling and what he's thinking and you, there's no handbook for it but uh, after 21 years now I'm pretty confident when I assess what he's trying to let me know. So it's not a perfect system, but it works for us. He does a lot of indicating just with his eyes, like he'll look at something and you'll know, okay, that's what he wants. But the thing, main thing that he wants is just to be part of the action. Like whatever happens to be going on, he wants to be part of the group. He may not participate, but he wants to be in the group and feel the excitement of the group. 
The hardest thing to figure out is when you can tell he's in pain, but he can't tell you why. And the only time you really can tell is if he starts crying. And this is a kid with an insanely high pain threshold. He used to giggle when he got finger pokes for blood tests. So he, he's really hurt when you know that he's making overt signs of being hurt. And it's just, it guts you trying to figure out what the problem is and, and being unable to because he can't tell you. When she was younger, it was challenging. She would tend to have more temper tantrums or, or, or meltdowns. And it was hard to communicate with her because she would totally shut down. And as Beth has grown, um, things have improved immensely. She's able to, to deal with stressful situations and uh, probably I'm better at understanding them, but she's also better at communicating what troubles her, what bothers her. I do think there's a, a closer bond and, and it's enjoyable to spend time together uh, as Beth has gotten older. Um, she's able to do more things. So uh, we'll go out and ride our bikes together, go for walks together. Um, Beth loves to shop, so you know we can share that or, or, or go to a movie. So I, I think it has brought us closer together. And we also sort of learned a lot through trial and error too. So, you know, as she was younger, we would try things with her and, and things may or may not turn out very well as you try new things, but have a much better idea of where the limits are and, and what she likes to do and, and what she doesn't really like to do. It's amazing how much of a difference just that participation with the Special Olympics, going to the Canadian Games and going to the National Games. Her fitness got up to the standpoint that we could actually take her on a walk and, and not lose her after a block or two. And so we like to be active and being able to do things with her that way has been a huge advantage as well. So you see the importance of parents knowing the child and be able to have that meaningful participation as a family it was very important for the families in the study. Also important that families wanted, to, wanted others to know about what it what makes them able to have meaningful participation is for others to know the work that parents do. Um, so parents in our study talked a lot about, you know, the commitment they had in raising their child and also the intensive, par the intensive parenting that this would often involve in caring for their child. As these two um, quotes demonstrate the work involved that parents had to do. And these were just some of the photos that they took that involved the work in caring for a child with complex care needs. And throughout the interviews, there were very numerous cliches um, that parents would talk about, dead women walking, the battle, red tape, 24-7 care, and so on, jumping through the hoops, a lot more going on, things are rolling and getting the ball rolling. And again, so again, to be able to have meaningful participation it involved a lot of work on the parts of the parents and the family unit. Um, and a feature uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the intense work would be that um, sometimes children remain at a fixed developmental stage um, and they would be struggling as caring for that child at that fixed stage and the child's moving on to another developmental sta stage. So it was added, work was added upon added for these families. Um, so, uh, when you look at the ro role of the parents, the parents in this study, be, they, be, 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 they, they were more than just parents. Um, they took on the role of healthcare provider, case manager, um, where they're coordinating all the care, student, where they had to learn ongoing learning, teacher, where they were teaching many others, and detective, as that one father talked about, being a detective, um, protecting and guarding the child and being the advocate. Um, and again, I think all parents, do this work, regardless if you have a child with complex care needs or not. But for, like, for parents of children with complex care needs, I think it's more intense and it's more, more ongoing. 
And also parents talk about times, sometimes um, the work being derailed, where you, know, you think you have control and then things happen um, that take a life of their own, so to speak. Um, parents in our study talked about describing their partnership almost like a tag team. To be able to get all the work done, one would take over the other and, and so on, and, and would take care of the, the child without complex care needs, where the other parent would take, do the work of, for the child with the complex care needs. Um, the children in the study, the children with complex care needs, also recognized and appreciated what their family did for them, as this one quote demonstrates. Aaron and my mom and dad, they have been nothing but supportive of me since I was born. <laughs> uh, they've always like helped me in any way they can to achieve like my goals or what I want to achieve. It's as simple as like transportation somewhere or just everyday things that you can't always do yourself but they're there to help you out with. Having a supportive family has definitely been key to me living my life the way I have and how I hopefully will continue to live. And they've definitely been the key to my uh, success and the reason I've continued to stay positive throughout the whole process. In a typical day when Dean is healthy and not in the hospital, you get up in the morning, do what you need to do, then you go and get him out of bed, change him, clean him up, start uh, his feeding bags. When feeding is over, he gets his meds, then I take him to school, and then I go to work. I've been doing this for so long now, it's sort of part of the fabric of my life. It's hard to, to analyze and say what could make it easier. The hardest part is the mental stress, having to deal with medical professionals, dealing with the school, even the best intentioned uh, program at a school, you sometimes run into problems. And then, of course, it's the constant worry because your kid is nonverbal. So are the people that are looking after him during the day able to interpret what he's trying to let them know? The only support system that is really in place at this point is uh, we can call Dean's worker and say we need home care for Dean on such and such a date and if we're really really desperate we can call him and say we need home care tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think there's anything parents can't do. So again emphasizing the work that parents do but also how uh, the youth and the children in the study really love and, and appreciate the work and the support that they get. Another theme that really relates to um, families be, being able to have meaningful participation in everyday life is, if only we knew. And that's the thing about previously discussed today, knowing what just, you don't know or knowing the what right, right questions to ask. So, you know, if only parents knew. Um, Again, a part of knowing was knowing what resources to harness, so to speak. Um, so again, if you, don't, if, you, if you didn't have somebody to really coordinate, coordinate the care and ensure that you get the resources that will help you in your, in your daily life, um, you won't know those questions as well to ask. As this one father talks about, And again, this, this mom and dad talking about having the resource of risk by care, not always having that, the, the, how you really want it. The families talked a lot about respite in the study, and through this, um, our family advisory, we have decided that the next study will be looking at developing a new model of respite care that will eventually be tested. Mm -hmm. 
it's been great. I was 90% uh, scared and worried and 10% pissed off <laughs> because here's this perfect little boy and wait a minute, he's broken. <laughs> when you first start out, you have all the same preconceptions and, and issues that any new parent has. And then you have the added learning curve of having to realize that you are the advocate for your child. You have to do a lot of research. You have to do a lot of standing up for yourself because medical professions, given the, given the option, will steamroll you. And uh, government agencies, uh, as I say, they like to put people into their proper pigeonhole because it makes the paperwork easier. So you spend a lot of time before an appointment or a meeting and writing down all the things that you can possibly think of asking. Is there any kind of uh, respite support that I can get? Is there any kind of support for buying my child's medications? Can I get a discount on daycare because I need the daycare in order to have my so-called productive day job? These are all things that we never thought of asking. We didn't even know that we could get respite. So especially if you have a child that doesn't have a specific diagnosed problem, you really have to ask for the things that they are, that they can provide you to help you. A major part of it is if they don't have a name for something, you often won't get supports. And it was actually probably the most minor of Beth's deficiencies was her hearing because it was well taken care of with the hearing aids. But the SMD, Society for Manitobans with Disabilities, started following her almost right away, which was great because the system in Manitoba is essentially focused on adults. And in order to get support, you need to have some kind of an advocate with an agency like that. The first one that I wish I would have known when Beth was younger is that um, we had respite available to us that would have been so helpful uh, when Beth was really young and I was having to get her to different appointments because I wasn't quite sure what to do with my other two children. Fortunately, Jim's mom lives in the city and she helped me out a lot. So uh, I think a very important question to ask is what supports are out there? Respite is one of them. Uh, I, I guess as the child moves into the school system, um, one thing to find out is what does the school system have to offer? Because as soon as your child turns six, they no longer receive the services, in our case, from SMD. So we were reliant on the school providing speech, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, or otherwise we could have done it privately. So I think it's important for parents to understand or to ask how long do do I have access to these special services for my child? Does it change when they enter the school system? And if it does, what does the school system have to offer? You know, we, we didn't know in advance. It wasn't that somebody laid out a plan for the next 10 years and said, when you get to this stage, you may see this happening. Um, it might have been a little bit nicer to have a bit of a roadmap onto what was coming, but how you could predict any sequence of events in the right order and at the right time would be difficult, so we never really felt that, that was a problem. So, um, in addition to parents knowing, parents and the families talk about if only people knew. And um, families constantly experience barriers to the enjoyment of basic human rights and inclusion in society. Um, stigma, discrimination, inclusion were parts of daily life for some children with complex care needs and or disabilities and their families in this project. Families in our study felt that society in general watched and judged them and judged them more harshly compared to other families. Um, so, um, and for some families, this is an example of one of the eco maps because they didn't feel accepted. Um, the only landscape in, the, in their fam the, the only landscape they, they interacted in was with their family, the whole, just their family unit. So, where some families would have um, other circles of where they participated, there were some families, it was just a family unit, and they preferred that, that, that way as well for some families because they felt more um, safer, so to speak. 
And here are two examples about if only people knew what families experience that um, uh, um, uh, parents talk about. And especially to letting others know um, the work involved and you know, this, what, they, what they experience. Things I can do, but there's no need to like change plans or change the way you treat me just because of my disability. I haven't felt like an outsider just because of the like huge support that my family has given me, as well as like the close group of friends. So they've been super supportive. I can do pretty much anything the same as you, just a bit differently or a bit slower. But <laughs> Daniel can't walk that far. If we're going into a mall or going into a store, he can't walk from the end of the Walmart parking lot. People sitting in there and they say, oh, we're just waiting for someone, we're not gonna be long. Well, we can't get in. You just need a space that's close and they just kind of take advantage of stuff like that. So people don't see it. And I think you have to walk a mile in someone hmm? or on their crutches or in their wheelchair to figure right. it out. When Daniel was younger, we would go out and I remember other kids or even grown-ups which it bothered me a little bit more when it was grown-ups to <laughs> look at him like something's not right and you know Daniel I mean he was very mature about it too we talked about it and and I said you know I, people don't understand you know you're different they're curious they might have questions he, little little guy or little girl come up to him one time to say why are your arms like that and so we had this dialogue and I said, you know, you can tell them. Like, if you feel comfortable, you can say, I was born that way. And I remember him um, saying that to when they did ask him that. And as he got a little bit older, though, he, <laughs> he was a little more annoyed with grown-ups who would kind of look at him and he would say, I'm giving him the death stare. <laughs> but I mean, he, you know, he didn't mean it, but it, it was just out of ignorance. Understanding, people are just curious and it's, it's harmless. You know, they've never said anything negative, negative to him. So, yeah, it, it doesn't feel good, but you understand that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. If only people knew how rewarding and fulfilling it is to raise a special needs child, the rewards far exceed the, uh, the stress and the, the worry. I don't think, in general, people can understand just how draining it gets changing diapers five or six times a day for 20 odd years. It's not something you really want to share with people either, but that's, that, that's an aspect that uh, no one really thinks about. A lot of people will avoid you. Even, even family members, you don't see as much of them. There's sort of a, almost a, a sense like they're afraid their kids might catch a disorder or something. And the other group that sort of irritates me a little bit are the ones that think that we have such a horribly hard life, we couldn't possibly be having a good family life or, or a good time. And that's not to say we don't have rough patches, but uh, Dean is a wonderful kid. He's happy 99% of the time. And I, I see parents with quote unquote normal teenagers and I think, Boy, oh boy, do you have a rough. For the most part, I find little kids seem to be way better with special needs than any adults. Little kids will come up to you and say, what's wrong with him? To me, that's a lot easier to deal with than uh, people acting like he's not even there or that there's nothing wrong with him. If, if someone wants to ask us questions about Dean, if they're polite and, and you know, actually care, we're very open to it. In our case with the three children all born so close together, it was really just that we were getting into the depths of trying to understand where Beth was and getting diagnoses and taking her for various kinds of therapy appointments. It became very hard to try and keep up with our normal lives. People didn't seem to understand why it was so difficult for us to get around and do the things that we used to do. Probably where it most stood out was when Beth became school age and you'd be in the schoolyard with the other parents and they would be discussing their, their child is 
participating in this sport or this activity or they were planning play dates and and I knew Beth would never be included in in those situations. I, I think that was the worst was the, that feeling of isolation um, because I never really got to know the other parents because Beth was never included in that that circle. It's very easy to look at, at a child like Beth and just sort of say that she can't, probably can't do very much, but she has some tremendous capabilities. She's wonderful with young people. She uh, goes and volunteers even this morning. She was at the YMCA, took her own bus to get there. Well, I mean, taking the buses is one thing, but having the gumption to get up and go to the Y and on her own time just to go and see the kids and participate in that. How much she cares about her family, you know, even even if her brother and sister knew how much she cares about them, I think they would be a lot more, a lot kinder and a lot more patient with her. With Beth's condition, you can't really tell from, from afar that she has a special needs. So you might think, oh, she's just really, really weird, but they don't really understand that she's maybe at the the learning level of somebody who's in grade two, but she can still communicate like somebody her age. When you don't know what she has, it's also difficult to explain it to other people. Like my teammates this year, I said I had two sisters, but I would only really talk about Mary, so I don't think I ever talked about Beth once because it's just too difficult and people maybe pity you or, or do that. So if they're never gonna see Beth or Mary, I just don't really ever, ever mention her. There, there is definitely a kind of a stigma attached to it. Like that's, it's, if they wanted to, they could change it. People don't really get that they're stuck like that. It's not their fault. It's not anyone's fault. They're still people too, and they're just doing the best that they can. So, as you can see, the family some um, stress the importance of people, you know, knowing yes, there's work involved, but also, you know, raising a child um, with special needs. Um, how the joy and so on. So um, it's really about educating the general public. So um, why is, uh, is it important for families to have um, meaningful participation? And why is it, it we have to break down the barriers? Um, well, families in our study share the importance of meaningful uh, participation contributed to them having a life. Um, for them, it meant uh, feeling a sense of belonging, a sense of acceptance, of being able to contribute to society. Um, and by engaging in meaningful participation, it, it resulted in an enhanced sense of well-being um, for the whole family. And have, uh, having a life also meant contributing to society, as this one um, quote um, uh, indicates by her father. And here's an example of a couple of brothers talking about having a life by, because of meaningful participation and being able to do things with their families. One brother would take part in going for every Sunday, um, going to an ice cream place for ice cream after church. And another one talking about, you know, being with his brother with special needs and teaching him to do stuff such as diving. Um, so um, siblings also, they could, there, we had quite a few siblings who participated in the study, and they reinforced what the family unit as a whole said about, you know, what participation means and why it's important. It's about feeling good. Um, and they also shared with us ways to promote participation. So um, families also talked about you know, what can be done so that they would have more meaningful participation in their lives. And they, some of these are not surprising about having fi more financial supports. Um, efficient respite services was a really um, big issue with our families and hence the reason why we're gonna be looking at respite. Um, having qualified um, professional and, as, and support workers. Um, the f family and community supports were, were also um, uh, reinforced and access to services and supports. And finally, as accessible spaces and also transportation was a key um, uh, point for these families. 
um, having an accessible transportation. Um, and also integrated knowledge translation where the communication is throughout the whole um, community of uh, people who they're involved with so that people know what's going on and so that they families would be able to, um, uh, the barriers would be broken down to having meaningful participation. I just want to share with you as well um, as what some of the siblings talked about promoting participation for themselves and that would be also for their brother and sisters. It's about exposure to recreational activities, having more supportive net networks and also being aware, the families it's saying that the parents need to be aware of supports and services for them and their families. They also stress though, they're very concerned about their family unit and their parents and about having parents taking time to relax and take care of, and, and take care of themselves so that they would be uh, physically able and mentally able to participate with them. Um, and again, promoting well-being, having an awareness of community about the needs, the community being about the needs of, this, of the siblings. So um, these families, um, again, really strive to have meaningful participation, but as you can see, there were challenges for them to be able to um, participate. And lastly, I just want to share um, with the work that I do with families, uh, I developed this framework in, to engaging um, families in research and to make it m very meaningful and authentic. I'm not going to go over this, but um, it, talks, it talks about very different attributes that are needed from um, self-awareness and self-regulation, uh, having relational engagement and so on. I have a paper on this if anybody is interested in this. So I'm just going to end by just showing you some uh, pictures of the families took where um, they were participating in everyday life. Halloween again. That's all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. That beautiful presentation. We have oh, a small thank gift. Thank you so much. You. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you for sharing your pioneering work on engaging children and youth in research and meaningful participation. I think you've done a great job of tying together all the talks that came before, touching on the arts and family needs, and that message really came across so strongly. What an incredible day of uh, presentations and discussions. I hope you've all been inspired by what we've heard today from our speakers, uh, from fabrics to dance, from quick hits to live experience, uh, family needs to interventions based on av advanced physical activity skills, our town hall, and now our keynote speaker. I think a common element for the day, throughout the day for me uh, was really the emphasis on the common humanity that we all share. Mm -hmm. And I think it's captured in our vision, uh, in our new strategic plan, the most meaningful and healthy futures for all children and youth. And I'm reminded by a, a quotation from Jean Vanier, which is, mm -hmm. and you've heard me say this many times, that we are called not to do extraordinary things, but ordinary things with extraordinary love. And I have to say, sitting here listening to the talks today, I felt that immense extraordinary love amongst all the presenters. So I uh, don't know if Manuela, you have anything you wanted to reflect on? Okay. Um, I'm just following yes. the script. <laughs> <laughs> I have something, come like something was not prepared, but um, first of all, I want to thank you for these great opportunities. Uh, especially Tom and Laurie, Nadia and Michelle. Uh, that was a great experience that I lived with um, a lot of enthusiasm, excitement, but also with some anxiety. <laughs> and if I think uh, what I would like you bring home after this great uh, day together, um, I think not only to the high, like, level of professionalism and knowledge, all the findings there, so, like, uh, great. Um, I, would love, I would like that you bring home all the passion and the dedication and the commitment that uh, all people that work here um, and also like uh, the students, the training, the family um, are doing every single day. So they're uh, using, like, they're spending their time and then energies uh, in what in something they believe in. So they see that not, something needs to be changed and they work hard to make this change happen. It really, uh, like, work to make a healthier and more meaningful future for our kids. And I like the combination of these two words, uh, just, um, 
think about what Lisa um, just let us think. Um, just the idea of, of wellness is something we should change and think the wellness as a personal, like the way uh, people, the perception the person has of him or herself, combined with the personal unique message the person wants to give to the society. And, um, and that it's probably possible if, like we, uh, we heard in, uh, in Roberta's presentation, if our kids can feel part of an action, they can feel part of a group. And I can tell from my personal experience every day with my daughter, as this meaningful participation make a big, big difference in terms of um, happiness, sense of acceptance, and self-confidence building. I just want to conclude with uh, something that uh, my daughter told me just uh, last week. And she said, you know, Ma, um, be different is nice, it's cool. <laughs> and I asked, OK, why do you think be different is cool? She said, because, because of the fact that I'm different, mm -hmm. people around me, they have to come up with something different to let me learn. And I have to learn things differently. So it's less boring. It's so cool. <laughs> and so, like, so that's, that's what I say with you know, meaningful participation. So thank you again to be here today with us. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. That was lovely. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you, Manuela. So that concludes our 12th annual research symposium. I would like to thank you for joining us and thank all the presenters for the commitment to discovering for action. Thank you to the many people that made this day possible. There are many people, volunteers, planners, operation team members who passionately pulled together this event and for which we are grateful. I wanted to point out, oh, Nadia just left, but Nadia Tanel, who led the uh, symposium planning committee has worked hard over the last number of months. Oh, Nadia's right there. So <laughs> thank you so much, Nadia. A special thanks to our AV team and also our in-house uh, AV expert, Greg Bannon Krunenberg, for keeping visual sound on all the tech in top tip order. And to my co-host, Manuela, thank you for your leadership, not only today, but every day as an advisor to research. The family voice is critical, and we are lucky to have you as an incredible partner. Uh, this concludes the scientific program of our research symposium. I'm pleased to welcome Ron Adia as a talented young man with autism who will be playing the piano for us at the wine and cheese reception and being held in the Grocery Foundation in the atrium. So thank you, and we'll see you there at uh, 4.30, where we'll uh, present the awards for this year. Thank you. <laughs>